Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, where were the people from Cardiff sitting? Whatever. Hello. Is there anyone here from Eaglescliff? Oh, wow. <laughs> Eagles Cliff, where I live, is really small. Um, I have to say, it is absolutely unbelievable to be here this afternoon at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, the biggest crowd I've competed in front of on an athletics track is 110,000 people. But this is quite scary, actually. <laughs> and um, I rang my husband on the way here, and he said, what are you doing this afternoon? And I said, I'm, I'm speaking at the WI AGM. And he went, wow, tough, <laughs> tough crowd. And then he said, at least there'll be cake. So maybe. I'm hoping there's going to be some cake. Um, but it's a privilege to be here this afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and it's amazing to be in front of so many women. Um, I very rarely get to speak in front of a crowd of women this size, so it's, it's fabulous to be here. But when I was looking around and seeing the WI is what you make of it and is everything that you want it to be, it's actually a bit of a motto for my life because I've had some amazing people who've helped me get to where I am, both through my sporting career and through my career in politics. Um, I got paralysed at the age of seven uh, back in 1976. And there were lots of people who told my parents about all the things I would never do with my life because I was in a wheelchair. People's attitude towards me changed literally overnight. And I was really fortunate because my parents just didn't believe any of that. They just saw me as Tanny, and they brought me up to have the same hopes and aspirations as my older sister. Now, my dad was an architect, and um, he refused to make our house wheelchair accessible because he didn't want to make it the only place that I ever lived because I was a bit of an annoying child, actually. <laughs> and um, he used to think that cobbles and steps were aesthetically pleasing. Um, which obviously I don't. But, but my father and my mother were a huge influence on my life in terms of encouraging me to play sport and to be fit and healthy. And back then, it wasn't about being a Paralympian. It wasn't about being an elite athlete. It was just about me being fit and healthy. And my dad's view was that, because back then there were no accessible toilets, there were no drop curbs, you know, disabled people were locked away. Um, dad's view was that if I came to a set of stairs and there was no lift, I should be able to get out of my chair, crawl up the steps and drag my chair. Um, which actually I still do these days. Um, although, I have to say, I'm, I'm not very keen on being carried up and down stairs. I do think in this day and age, you know, the world should be quite accessible. I do have to say, that went completely out of the window when we were bidding for the 2012 Olympics and Paralympics. I was in Singapore, I had to go to a meeting that was upstairs, there was no lift, and I was about to say, actually, you know what, guys, I don't think I'm going to go. And then Steve Redgrave stepped forward and offered to carry me up the stairs. <laughs> um, it gets better. <laughs> it does. So Steve said, I don't think I can carry you on my own anymore, because he has actually one time carried me up four flights of stairs in my chair on his own. Oh, wow. Man of my dreams. Um, he said something like, you're not as skinny as you used to be. <laughs> and then he said, oh, I need some help. And he said, oi, Dave, give us a hand. It was David Beckham. <laughs> I allowed myself to be carried up. <laughs> Just, um, went straight to the toilets to ring my best friend. <laughs> and then rang my husband, Ian, and um, he said that I was possibly the cheapest woman Beckham had ever picked up. But anyway, <laughs> no. But I give Ian a bit of a hard time, but he's been amazing. He was an athlete, he was my training partner, uh, my coach, my boss. Um, when we had a family, I have a 13-year-old daughter, he gave up his racing career so that I could carry on competing. Um, and he's been incredible in my career as well. I couldn't have done the things in sport without him. Um, I knew he was the man for me when actually the first present he ever bought me was a carbon fibre front wheel. <laughs> um, it is good, honestly. Um, it's gone downhill over the years. We've been together 20 years now. Um, my last birthday present, he gave me some titanium bolts <coughs> and said, the weight doesn't really matter anymore, does it? <laughs> um, 
but Ian's been incredible, and, and my, my family too. So my, my father encouraged me to play basketball. I did think that was the sport that I wanted to do. I have to say, my, my only time I ever played for my school, I got fouled off for fighting. Um, <laughs> we played in mixed teams. It was a boy I hit, not a girl. Um, the referee said I punched somebody. Um, my defence was my hand was open, I only slapped them. <laughs> got sent off quite rightly. Um, and it was one of my PE teachers who said to me, go and do wheelchair racing because you can't get close enough to anyone to hit them. <laughs> um, and it, it wasn't a compliment. But for me, I found a sport that I just loved. Everything about it, the training, the people. I had some amazing training partners, some fantastic coaches. And from the age of 13, every decision I made was based around me doing wheelchair racing. Um, it dictated me going to Loughborough University. Um, you know, it dictated actually who I married. Um, it even dictated the birth of our daughter because I really, really wanted to compete in the Commonwealth Games in 2002 for Wales. And it was 2001. So I did what any female athlete would do. I counted back six months from the Commonwealth Games. <laughs> I counted back 40 weeks and said to Ian, this is the date I need to be pregnant by. <laughs> You don't need to know any more than that, but um, <laughs> I can't believe I said that in front of the WI. Um, <laughs> but, but we have a beautiful 13-year-old daughter. She was born in February 2002. Um, so my life in sport is, you know, I got to travel the world. I got to compete with some, some fantastic people. I'm, I'm really, really privileged. There's other things that I've got to do because of my life in sport. Um, I've had a giraffe named after me at London Zoo, <laughs> which is pretty cool. I went to visit it. it wouldn't come anywhere near me. And after about half an hour, the zookeeper said, look, have your picture taken with Sir Edmund Hillary, because no one will know the difference. <laughs> I, I did get to feed Sir Edmund, um, and I do remember just getting dribbled on a lot. And as I was leaving, the saying to Ian, there's something that smells really bad around here, and he said, yes, it's you. <clears throat> Apparently, you can just sort of scrape the giraffe snot off afterwards. <clears throat> but there we go. Um, I've got to be on the weakest link. A sports person's version, we're very competitive, we're raising money for charity and we didn't have any tactical voting. We just decided that we just would do everything we could to raise as much money as possible. And um, the question that lost me £21,500 for charity, I got to the final, it was, name a Warwickshire town that's also a sport. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's really easy when you're sitting at home. <laughs> I sat there and I said, Warwickshire Town, Warwickshire Town, Warwickshire Town. There was nothing in my head. And when the answer was rugby, I went, oh, no. Oh. For weeks afterwards, people would come up to me and say, you are the weakest link, goodbye. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, yeah. Um, on the back of that, I got asked, would I like to do Mastermind? No. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, I really don't want to do Mastermind. And they tried a few times. And then I had the phone call which said, on the weakest link, you were raising money for a baby scanner, weren't you? In the hospital where your daughter was born. Yeah. Right, would you like to do Mastermind for Charity? <laughs> and then they said to me, think of those poor babies. <sighs> OK, I'll do it. And then they said to me, don't worry, you'll be on with really stupid people. You'll be fine. <laughs> My specialist subject was Star Wars, the original three films, because I thought I could learn. I had a few weeks, and my training group were amazing. Every day, each of them turned up with 50 questions on Star Wars. They learned everything there was ever to know about Star Wars with me. My training group were fantastic. And I kept thinking, stupid people, stupid people, stupid people, I'll be okay, I'll be okay, this, this is not a big deal. It was only when I got on to film the program did I find out who I was on with. I was on with the XMP, Giles Brandreth. The poet laureate at the time, Andrew Motion. Because <laughs> obviously he's really stupid, isn't he? Yeah. And Stephen Fry. <laughs> yes. Uh, I got 14 on specialist knowledge. The three guys got eight. Yes. And then general knowledge. And it was the longest minute of my life. Stephen Fry, I think, got 17 on general knowledge. I got three. Um, <laughs> 
You would not believe how long that minute was. Um, anyway, I came second, which is good. Um, and it's the only time in my life I would say, it's not the winning, it's the taking part. <laughs> oh, but, but I've been really lucky to kind of to, to do those things. Uh, really cool, actually, and really exciting. Um, and, and life as an athlete was, was great. You know, I got to have some really, really close friends, some amazing people who are still in my life. We trained really hard. We trained 12 to 15 times a week, 50 weeks of the year. And I competed at five games. But if I add up the total length of time that I spent on the track competing at the Paralympics, it's 19 and a half minutes of my life. So I know it's not very much, but the reason I trained really, really hard was because I knew I had this limited time to achieve and because I wanted to be the best I could. I wanted to kind of, I guess, prove to my parents and prove to people around me that everything they'd done to help me and, and help my career was something that I should be worthy of. Because again, without my parents, they fought to get me into mainstream school. Actually, my dad threatened to sue the Secretary of State for Wales over my right to be in a mainstream school. But, but without all that, I wouldn't have had my career in sport. I wouldn't have gone to university. Um, I did do a politics degree at uni, never planned to go into politics. Actually said to my head of department just before I graduated, I will never, ever go into politics, because politics is for losers. <laughs> yeah. When I got into the House of Lords, he just sent me an email which just said, Dear Tanny, loser. <laughs> For me, it, wasn't, it, it was just part of the transition. In my time competing, I did a lot on athlete welfare, a lot about protecting athletes' rights, but a lot about supporting athletes, because life as an athlete is not balanced. You spend a huge amount of time training, competing. It's a very isolated world. And then, if you're really lucky, you retire when you're 35. And to move out of that into another life, for a lot of athletes, is, is really difficult. So for me, I'd been involved in lots of other things. But when I had the chance, to, to go into the Lords. It was quite a surreal experience, I have to say. So I was brought down to London for an interview. Um, it was two hours long. The first question I was asked was, what's the most interesting debate you've ever listened to? And I listed some debates. And my second question was, what's the most boring debate you've ever listened to? And I said, oh, they're all very interesting. <clears throat> and my interview panel laughed at me. And they just said, no, 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 we have very technical debates. They're, they're not always very exciting. So I had this interview, didn't know how I'd done it. It was really difficult to gauge it, and I left. And I didn't hear anything for about nine months. And to be honest, by that time, I thought I'd blown my chances. And they said to me, if you don't get through, you will just never hear from us ever again. Anyway, I got called for a second interview. Came all the way down to London. My interview lasted about three minutes. <laughs> And the only question I was asked was, is there anything you'd like to tell us? Not really. So, are you sure? Is there anything from your past that you would like to tell us? <laughs> no, don't think so. I mean, thank you very much, you can go now. OK, right, off, off I went back to Darlington. Um, every month, for about another five months, I'd have a phone call saying, are you sure there's nothing from your background that you forgot? <coughs> And you start doubting yourself, you're thinking, have I done something really bad that I've forgotten about? I'm like, no, no, no. And eventually, I said to the woman who was ringing me, I'm really sorry, I'm obviously missing something here. Could you just give me a bit of a clue? You know, I've had a few parking tickets, and a couple of speeding tickets. Oh, not many. Um, and, you know, just that, that's kind of it. And she said, well, what we really want to know is, have you ever been a terrorist? No. Definitely not. And she went, oh, that's okay. We just need you to know. I went, okay. It's very British, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know why they just didn't ask me. But they said, you know, obviously, with the troubles in Northern Ireland and different things, at times there's people who would have been considered terrorists that are no longer terrorists. And, and apparently, if I just, if I had been, if I just said I was, it would have been okay. Went, okay. So again, didn't hear anything, went home. And then it was a Tuesday evening, and my daughter had come home from school. And she has different ways of saying mum. So when she wants something, she says mummy. When she's lost something, she says mum. And the rest of the time, it's just mum. And she was like, mummy. I went, OK, what do you want? Nothing, nothing. She said, I forgot to tell you, I need green felt for school tomorrow. Went, oh, why do they do this? So it's half past seven at night, we get in the car. We're driving from Eagles Cliff to the local shopping centre. 
We charge into hobby crafts. She's there picking up all sorts of different felt that's not green. We start having a bit of a family row. It's like, just, you wanted green felt, just buy green felt. Just, just buy all the green felt. I would love to tell you our family's like the Waltons, but it's... Sometimes it is, but mostly it's not. And then we're having this sort of little bit of a row about felt and other stuff, and it was just... And the shop is about to close. And my phone beeped. And I had an email that said, at Friday, at 10 o'clock, it will be announced you're going into the House of Lords. <coughs> wow. OK. I showed Ian. <clears throat> now, Ian pretends to be a bit of a Republican. He's not really, but he just pretends. Um, and he said to me, come the revolution, you're added to the list of people I'm going to shoot. <laughs> Thanks. Great. He just does it to be a bit clever, you know. Um, I rang my dad and was like, Dad, Dad, I'm in, I'm in. And he was like, oh. And my father said to me, before you get too excited, make sure they have the right Tanny Gray Thompson. <laughs> now, I don't want to be funny, but <laughs> Tanny is a made-up name. My sister didn't like the name I was christened and changed it, and it stuck. And the only reason I'm double-barreled is because the man who was running the world ranking lists when I got married couldn't cope if women changed their names and you'd lose your world ranking points. So I didn't have any grey and grand aim to be double barrel. I just stuck Thompson on the end. So there isn't anyone else that I've ever met who's called anything like Tanny Grey Thompson. So I just thought, OK, Dad, that's fine. <clears throat> and then I thought I did a really good job of explaining to Karis, my daughter. And she said, when I go into school on Friday, can I tell my teacher? So I said, yeah, of course you can. Brilliant. And um, I went to pick her up from school on Friday, and her teacher said to me, congratulations, you must be very excited. I went, yes, I am. And um, she said to me, it's a shame you've got to be in London, but if you work really, really hard, maybe you could get promoted back to Darlington. <laughs> no, I can't. I really can't. And she said, look, don't hold yourself back. She said, you know, you know everything you've ever s spoken to us about is about having a goal and a dream, and it's about being the best you can. It's about working hard, and it's about, you know, aiming for those things. She said, you know, if you put everything that you le learned from sport into that, you know, you can get promoted back to Darlington. <laughs> so I said to her, so what, what did Karis tell you I was going to do? And she got a bit, a bit embarrassed, and she said, well, tell you what, you tell me what you're going to do first. So I said, well, I'm going to be a crossbench peer in the House of Lords. And she went, oh. Karis told her I had a job collecting tickets at Westminster Tube Station. <laughs> Great. I know. Because I, I said to her, do you remember that day, like, Karis, when we went to London, we went to the House of Parliament, we came out of Westminster Tube Station, we gave our ticket in. I'm like, yeah, that was it. So anyway, um, my, my family are amazing. I mean, they're very level, they're very grounding, or something like that. But they are incredible, because, again, you know, Ian... Without him at home, he's at home with our daughter all the time. Um, I couldn't be in London, I couldn't do the things I do. Um, and House of Lords is an incredibly privileged place to be. It is absolutely amazing. People might not like what you say, but they listen to what you say, and that is hugely empowering. And people have also been incredibly helpful when I first went there, um, because it is quite scary. You know, the first time you speak, the first time you take something to a vote, it's people's lives that you're having an impact on. You know, sport for me was important, but sport is actually quite selfish. You know, it was what I wanted to do. The things that I'm involved in now have an impact on, on other people's lives. And I remember the first week I was there, um, we take afternoon tea and cake very seriously. So we have a, a long table, and you have to take the next free seat. And it's an incredible way to meet people and, and to learn about things that people are involved in. And I went in, I sat down, and this chap who was about 85 said to me, don't worry, my dear, this is just like boarding school. <laughs> Didn't go to boarding school. He went, oh, which, which day school did you go to? I said, actually, I went to a comprehensive in South Wales. And he looked at me and went, good God. <laughs> and I'll be really honest, I remember sitting there thinking, wow, I don't think I'm ever going to get used to this place. You know, I'm really not going to find this very easy. And then I'd, I'd done my maiden speech, and the first time I was trying to ask a question in the chamber, and it's packed full of people, you know, there's 300 peers in the chamber, and it was a question on the Olympics and Paralympics. And because we're self-regulating, you have to stand when you want to ask a question, and everyone has a look around, 
and see, watches who else is standing up and see who knows what about the subject. And then we decide who speaks. And it's quite hard because I can't stand. So I remember going in being very, very nervous and thinking, what am I going to do? And I thought, I'm just going to have to sit there and just keep saying, my lords, my lords, my lords, until somebody realises I'm trying to speak. And this peer came in and he sat next to me and he said, you're going to try and ask a question? And I said, yes, I am. And he went, right. He said, don't worry about it. So when the time came, he stood up, he glowered at everybody in the chamber <laughs> and just went, great, Thompson. <laughs> Everyone else sat down. <laughs> and I went, oh. And I asked my question. <laughs> so for me, it's, it's an incredible place to be because people want to beat you when you're at your best. They don't want to beat you because you don't know the rules or you, you, you haven't been the best you can. And, and that is an amazing place to be. So some of the things that I work on, I work on welfare reform, I work on legal aid, um, I work on a lot of disability rights work. Uh, and I also do a lot of work around people being fit and active and healthy. Because actually, 80% of women in the UK today are not fit enough to be healthy. 80% of women. Women don't give themselves permission to do physical activity. Because when you're working and you're a mum and you're trying to do a million different things and you're, you know, you're trying to balance family life, women don't take time out for themselves. And if there's one thing I could change, it would be revolutionising the teaching of PE in schools. Because I had really, really good PE teachers but, but not everyone has that kind of experience. I mean, quick, how many women here do physical activity? See, oh, that's amazing. But that's the WI influence. You know, that's, it is. Because it's about healthy mind, body, spirit. If we could influence all the other women out there who don't do physical activity to be healthier, it has a massive implication on the National Health Service, on being a mum, on working, on pension age. It, it affects so many different things. So that's the, the thing that I'm, I'm working on at the moment to try and bring a, about change. And kind of, I kind of believe that I can do it because a lot of the things that I learned from sport about never giving up, about resilience, about getting to meet different people, about bringing people together, just transfers straight over from sport in, and into politics. And, and for me, that's just really important, um, to keep trying to change other people's lives. Because the experience I had um, is not the experience lots of other women or lots of other disabled women get. We had a debate last year where it was um, tabled by Baroness Mary Warnock, and she is the reason that I got into mainstream education. Um, she wrote a report back in the late 70s, which said that every disabled child had the right to be educated in a mainstream environment. And that's the report that my father used to kind of sue the Secretary of State for Wales. Um, and people wonder why I'm stropping. Um, and I got to sit in the chamber and say to her, because of you, I'm here today. She did look at me like I was slightly strange. Um, but for me, it's, it's about bringing about those changes. It's about trying to give opportunities to, to other young women. And the reason that I am the way I am is because my grandmother was born in 1900. Um, she had my mum when she was in her very late 40s. She grew up without the right to vote for the first 30 years of her life. She grew up in a very, very different world where women were treated differently. And she had a really strong influence on my mum. And then my mum had a really, really strong influence on me to kind of aspire to do the things I wanted, to kind of to work, to go to university, to be the best that I could be. And for me, that's really important, that women have to kind of pass on that message to other women, to kind of encourage the young women, a lot of young women today think that, you know, everything's fine and it's, it's equality and it is better than it used to be. But, but we've got a long way to go. And I suppose a lot of the reason I do the things I do is because, you know, I think about my, my grandmother and my mum and, and, and all those people that have had an influence on me. And it's about trying to change those things for the better. Um, and one of the things that keeps me going, actually, was a saying that my grandfather had. Now, it's not as cool as some of the family mottos of people I work with. Um, I actually share an office with a woman who can date a family tree back to 1066. Um, her family motto is Latin, uh, mine is Welsh. Um, I'll give you the English version, because it might not make sense. Um, my grandfather used to say to me, Tani, aim high, even if you hit a cabbage. <laughs> now, I apologise if you're expecting something more intellectual than that. Um, <laughs> But it's about having a goal and a dream. It's about seeing what you can achieve. 
When I was a young athlete, I didn't win a race for the first five years I competed. Nobody thought I had talent until I got to 17. Um, but I had this aspiration to be, to be an athlete. It was about never being afraid to be on the start line. Before virtually every single race I did, I used to get sick with nerves. I actually used to physically throw up because I used to get to the start line and think, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not this, I'm not that. Will I, you know, will I win, will I lose? And, and it's about not being afraid to try because actually that's when you push yourself to your limits, when you learn not to be afraid to try because what's the worst thing that can happen? In the work that I do now, the worst thing that can happen is I lose a vote. And that's not great, you know, when, when you see some of the things, um, you know, legal aid cuts to uh, abuse women, things like that, it's really not great when you lose a vote. But it makes you come back and be more determined next time and be more resilient and find a better way to have another go to bring about those changes to protect women and, and to protect other people. And for me, that's really important that I can honestly say in the whole of my career um, that what I've tried to do is aim high. I've never yet hit a cabbage, um, but it's about being the best you can. And I guess the final thing I want to say is, you know, for my daughter, who's now 13, going on about 27. Um, I picked her up from school the other week and she said to me, Mummy, what are you going to wear? I went, oh. So we had a discussion. We agreed what I was going to wear to pick her up. And I said to her, you... I know. <laughs> Do you know what? You, know, just, you might as well go with it, really. And I said to her, um, what about Daddy? And she looked at me, she went, Daddy is beyond hope. <laughs> so do you know what I take away from that? My, I'm still salvageable as a mum. Um, we have one rule with Karis to, you know, it's hard being a mum, it's, it's the hardest thing I've done. Um, I have one rule is I do not give a chocolate for breakfast. As long as I do that, I'm a good mum. That's it. <laughs> I have given a Maltesers once. But basically there's no chocolate on there, so, you know, it doesn't count. And Ian has given Karis penguins for breakfast. I've worked it out there is more chocolate on penguins than Maltesers, so I'm a way better mum than he is a dad. <laughs> um, but what I want is actually just, you know, the same aspiration, you know, the, the same opportunities that I had. She's 13, she doesn't know whether she wants to be a human rights lawyer or a hairdresser. Personally, I'm going with hairdresser because um, this is potentially not my natural hair colour. And um, I, I think that would be good. But, you know, I, I looked at the things that my parents gave me and um, my dad was ill a few years ago and I wanted to say thank you to him. And I said to him, he showed me this book when, when I became paralysed. And it was all these amazing buildings from around the world and he told me I needed to travel, explore, I needed to do all these different things in my life. And, and that was a huge influence in my early life. And um, I said to dad, you know, thank you for that, you know, just... And he, he looked at me and went, I don't remember the conversation. Oh, great, OK. And about half an hour later, he said to me, yeah, he said, I do remember it. He said, me and your mum just didn't want you living at home forever. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so that's what I have to be grateful. He maybe could have said it in a better way. But um, for me, my, my parents, my husband, without them, I wouldn't achieve the things I do. So it's a huge thank you to them. Um, and thank you to you for allowing me to be here this afternoon. It's amazing to be here. I forgot to say hello to everyone who's watching in cinemas around the country. Um, Women's Institute is an amazing organisation. You should be really proud of everything you do uh, and keep up the good work. Thank you very much.